also known as MT1. Now, the motivation for doing this particular type of robot is the fact that there are mines that still exist all over the world. To be exact, there's 50 to 100 million people affected by mines today in 89 countries around the world. It is estimated that two people per day are either killed or seriously injured by these mines, mostly being women and children. Now, if you look at the picture, right, you can see the result of those who survive. Right? Those who survive either have to live with you know, the loss of limbs, or in the case of family, you have loss of friends and family members. Next slide, please. Now, hence, because of this, hence the, the reason we decided to develop this type of robot. The MT-1 is an autonomous platform robot that uses tri-tracks. As you can see, which is simple. Basically, it detects, marks, and maps the location of that mine. And of course, in the process, you don't want it to be terminated, so that's part of the mission parameter, to prevent itself from being terminated by actually running over a mine. Now, it does this by the use of several sensors. First, we have <coughs> the sonar sensor, which is used in obstacle detection and simple navigation, so it doesn't uh, collide with any obstacles. And second, we have ground penetrating metal detector, which basically finds metallic objects within mines and other types of metallic objects that would be buried beneath the ground. <coughs> now, the next thing it does, it plots an internal map of the area that it, has, it, it covers. So basically what you have is it'll cover a, a certain area in the field and it'll plot the points where <coughs> metal is detected. Now this can be retrieved by the use of an onboard computer or by simply introducing more memory space so that it can store this information. It also navigates the terrain using, like I said, the tri-tracks, which are these type of uh, tracks for the, for the particular robot, which gives it the capability of maneuvering over um, the rough terrain. Now, another thing that we wanted to introduce with this robot was the use of GPS. And to hand it over to someone who can explain more is uh, Shannon Kassel. Um, the design is rather simple than you think. Uh, ideally, we would have used a GPS system, but since uh, we were financially and uh, time-wise constrained, so we, we weren't able to use that. But how exactly does the GPS works? It's very simple. It's a synchronization of four different satellites giving you uh, sending out signals to the receiver uh, in four dimensions, X, Y, Z, and T. So the receiver at all times knows where it is. Um, so ideally we would have used that, but we, we couldn't. Now we, we would have used a differential GPS because of its accuracy of one centimeter. A regular GPS could not be used in this, uh, in this kind of project because its accuracy is, is off. Uh, it's about three, three feet to three meters. A platform, uh, we could have chosen uh, a four or six servo wheel platform, but we decided to choose this one uh, because it's, it's less servo, it's like two servos, um, and it's uh, easier in the terrain and topology mapping. It can go on uh, rough terrains and maneuver around. Sensors, we have, we, we used uh, two sensors. The ultrasound uh, that you see hooked up uh, to the microcontroller over there and the metal detector. Uh, the ultrasound, we can thank FIU for that. Um, and the controllers, we, we used uh, two, two controllers, a microcontroller that you see over here in the picture as well as over here on the top, um, and, and the motor controller that's underneath this platform that, that uh, guides these two servos. Experimental test, uh, we had a lot of prob problem with the servo debugging and length of the travel. Servo debugging was basically if, if it uh, made a turn, it was either too sharp or, or it wasn't exactly 90, so we were off of the turns. Uh, as a result, we were off on the path, we couldn't get on the path. Uh, same with the length of travel, once it made the turn, it kept moving on, moving on, it never turned back. Um, and then detection sensitivity, either it was way too sensitive, it started detecting uh, the pipes and metals laid underground, or it was uh, too slow to detect, um, as you can see in the, in the video here, it, it couldn't detect that, that piece of metal over there, in this case a cell phone. Ooh, mission accomplished. Okay, finally we're actually able to detect the mines. 
Uh, the, of course, this took a lot of debugging as part of the as part of the experimental test. As you saw earlier, it would run over the cell phone. It would detect it, it would detect too much metal. There was a point where it was actually detecting rebar inside the ground and going crazy. Uh, we finally, as you can see in this video, got it to work correctly. It avoided it avoided the mine, therefore not not blowing up the robot. Next was the optical avoidance, which was used with the ultrasound. Uh, it's pretty much just the same path as when it finds a mine. It'll stop, detect, detect said mine, and go, detect said object, and go around it. Thirdly, of course, is the path followed. Now, this became more complicated than, than, previously, than we previously assumed. The, the path itself needs 90 degree turns to work correctly. Now, the servos themselves, no matter how much we fine tune them, Sometimes they would hit us 90, sometimes they do 85, sometimes they give us 95 degrees. We couldn't get it exactly perfectly to pinpoint its angle, its turn radius. This becomes a problem when you have, let's say, 40 turns and each turn is off by 2 degrees. You will eventually get completely off the path that it's supposed to be assigned to. That is why, go oh, next slide, we have the future concepts. Of course, we would like it to have the mappable GPS. This will eliminate the problem of this turning capability because it will know through a GPS plot which way it's supposed to be constantly aiming. Uh, the map of the GPS is necessary in order to send a signal back to the base via a radio communication, which would be another, another idea to add in the future to the robot. It would actually tell a, a base computer where it has just detected said mine. So it will detect the mine, go around it, at the same time send a signal to a base system telling it that, oh look, there's a mine here, somebody should send somebody out here to uh, dispose of said mine. Next idea would be, of course, smart detection. Right now it's equipped with one metal detector. Uh, we would like to actually include metal detector, infrared sensors, ground penetrating radar, even um, uh, chemical signature de de detection, which detects the, the minute amounts of TNT that are lying underground within the mine. All these systems together could actually make a smarter robot. It will know if what's buried is a can, a rock, or a mine, because it has to need a system of, of separate sensors in order to know what is down there. Lastly, of course, would be a full array of sensors. Uh, more uh, more uh, ultrasounds, infrared detection sensors. All these sensors combined will actually give it, right now it's only supposed to act in an open field, but let's say it has to go through a forest. All the trees is gonna cause problems within the system, within the program right now, because it doesn't have the, the, the amount of detection sensors necessary. And lastly, of course, would be a physical indicator. As exact as the GPS is, it's only within one to two centimeters. A mine is half a foot big. If it's off by two centimeters, the, the person going to dispose of the mine still has the problem that they might actually step on the mine and going to dispose. So the idea would be for the robot itself to mark the area around the mine with, let's say, uh, fluorescent paint, something, something, a flag, pin a flag down like a mine sweeper, something so it's physically there, said, okay, said mine is here. Uh, this is a very serious problem all over the world, actually. 89 countries have active line mines in them. People lose their lives daily. Uh, if you have any donations, feel free to donate to 1-800-RED-CROSS uh, and we thank you for your time today. Thank you. And, uh, okay.